Hi, my name is Tom Zaki, and I'm the founder and CEO of TerraCycle and Loop. And I'm just real pleasure to be here today. It's a great honor uh, to share with you uh, how we look at eliminating the idea of waste and what we've learned about the journey around the circular economy. Um, I will be taking questions at the end, so please do send in your uh, questions uh, uh, so that we can answer them at the end of this discussion. As a little bit of background, uh, in case you may not know who TerraCycle is, we've operated for 20 years uh, across 22 countries nationally, both as a nonprofit and as a for-profit organization, trying to think about how do we move systems that today are linear, effectively take, make, waste, and start bending them to become a circle and then tightening that circular economy. Just to share with you a couple of the lessons I've learned along the way is if we think about the first bend in a circular economy, typically it begins with recycling, being able to collect and recycle something into something else. Now, the big, biggest learning here by far is that we many times think about recycling as can something be recycled is what renders something pragmatically recyclable in our local supply chains. And in fact, what makes something recyclable is instead whether a garbage company can make money doing so. So at TerraCycle, we focus on how to recycle things that are hard to recycle, uh, from your cigarette butts to your dirty diapers. And since it's an economic issue, we can solve it simply with economics. If stakeholders, whether manufacturers, governments, retailers, even individual consumers are willing to pay for whatever it costs to collect the waste and process it minus the resulting value, if that cost can be funded, noting that could be done voluntarily through private enterprise or legislatively through EPR and deposit return schemes, then we can recycle anything. Now, if it's done voluntarily, it is very important to generate more value than cost. And this is what allows these platforms to live. Because through this type of thinking, anything can be recycled, whether cigarette butts shredded uh, uh, and the ash tobacco paper composted and the filter made into products like these, today collected and recycled across 400 cities around the world. Whether it's uh, aerosol containers into exercise parks or flip-flops into jungle gyms, Anything can be recycled, even PPE today all over the world uh, being recycled at supermarkets from Carrefour in France to Kmart in uh, uh, Sydney and Australia, all the way to car seats and retailers like Target and Walmart, even dirty diapers, which are now live in Holland and soon expanding to Japan and France. In this way, we can recycle everything, but the key is we have to think about the value equation and making sure that there are infused actors willing to fund these processes, and then they can scale. They can become larger systems, like pictured here in Germany, all the way to massive recycling systems, as you can see here recently what we deployed in partnership with ASDA in the UK. And this starts bending the circular economy so that we can recycle things. But as you notice, it's not quite a circle yet. The next step that we have to really think about as manufacturers is how do we integrate waste back into the, our products? And there is a big challenge in this. You know, many organizations, many consumer product companies specifically, have committed to using massive amounts of PCR or post-consumer recycled content uh, in three and a half years by 2025. But we design our products from a virgin mentality. And what I mean by that is we think about what virgin plastic can do in the characteristic of economic performance and uh, uh, physical performance of a material, and what tends to be able to make goods then are municipally sourced beverage containers. And that means that many areas of the world, our rivers, our oceans, our lakes, our inner cities, our Aboriginal communities, our natural environments are covered in waste that is today not being cleaned up. So in the long run, we have to really think in product design on how do we design to what waste is capable of not just the very best of waste, like municipally sourced beverage containers. In the short term, though, a way to unlock this is to leverage the power of narrative. For example, uh, we started this with P&G, collecting and recycling beach plastic from all over the world, uh, generating products like this, the world's first shampoo model, though 25% from such material. This archetype of leveraging narrative to clean up these important supply chains while we rethink the way we design products can go from the bottom of our ocean to the very top of our mountains. We're actually now working with a Swiss watch company to clean up the top of Mount Everest so that the oxygen tanks and heating elements that are abandoned there can be used to make their watches. And so in the short term, we can leverage this to create meaningful value across a whole range of these different supply chains. And that gets us to a circular economy based on recycling. I'd argue, you know, perhaps the best thing to do with disposable products, collect and recycle them and make sure they're made from recycled content. The question, though, is this the end point? And uh, we believe that there is even further we can go, which is to tighten the circle from a recycling-based circular economy to a reuse-based circular economy. Now, as we evaluated 
reuse. We've realized that reuse already exists at scale all over the world. In the United States, for example, our propane tanks are highly reusable, just like our beer kegs. But the major challenge is that we can't take the beer keg when it's empty to wherever we bought a propane tank, and vice versa, we can't take the propane tank when it's empty to wherever we bought a beer keg. And those are just two products. Reuse systems tend to stay in mono supply chains or stay in their lane. And so two and a half years ago, we formed a multi-stakeholder collabor uh, collaboration uh, through the World Economic Forum uh, that was launched as Loop uh, just two and a half years ago. And what Loop tries to achieve is to think about how to solve this. Again, this went live uh, uh, in Davos uh, just two and a half years ago, and today has a membership of over 120 of the world's biggest consumer product companies, 15 major retailers, uh, two dozen NGOs. And we think about how to create a platform for reuse, a platform that is as convenient as throwing something away. So consumer product companies can enter to create products and retailers can sell those, and we can live in a world where you can buy anywhere and return anywhere, effectively return that beer keg to where you bought the propane tank. What is exciting about reuse is that it unlocks a different way of thinking about economics. These are illustrative prices, but in disposable uh, packaging, the consumer purchases the entire uh, uh, price of that package when they buy their content. And it's strange because we own all this packaging that we don't really want to own as consumers. But in reusable packaging, similar to the innovations Airbnb did in the hotel industry or Uber and Lyft in the automotive uh, or taxi industry, the asset changes its construct. And so what goes into reusable packaging uh, is just the depreciation of the package and the cost of cleaning. And this enables breakthrough uh, uh, design capabilities. Nestle, who's since become an investor in Loop, is now doing a whole range of their products, just like P&G, who's also coincidentally an investor, doing a very wide range of goods. But again, over 120 consumer product companies from Unilever to uh, uh, Nestle to Kraft Heinz uh, have innovated in this and uh, either created new reusable package forms or thought about bringing back historic package forms, uh, whether it's your tomato ketchup bottle all the way to that historic iconic package of Coca-Cola. But reuse does allow innovation as well, not just a return to the past, whether it's breakthrough luxury uh, uh, shampoo from Unilever all the way to aftershave with Nivea. What we've learned so far in Loop is that it really requires a platform. Consumer products creating brand uh, products like you saw there, uh, but then more importantly, retailers making those available to consumers because with the retailers, real scale can be achieved very quickly. Now, when Loop first launched, uh, it launched as an online platform, and that gave way due to its success to retailers now all over the world launching these platforms in store. The first retailer in the world was Carrefour to do so, as you can see pictured here, everything from your Nutella to your Herbal Essence shampoo to your Nesquik available in reusable packaging that you can purchase. The only addition is the concept of a deposit and then return when empty to uh, a, a kiosk at the front of the store at any retailer, whether you purchase there or not. And we have noticed uh, that consumers are ready for this now. 80% of packaging is coming back within 60 days of purchase. Also, consumers tend to be not so sensitive to the price of a deposit while they do wish the value of their content to be reasonable. From there, all of this uh, waste effectively goes into the reuse waste management function, which Loop operates. Uh, with facilities now in six countries around the world, picture here is in the UK, we formed uh, uh, leading partnerships with companies like Ecolab, who have embedded their cleaning facilities into our operations, cleaning at the very highest of standards, which we found is incredibly important, especially in this time of pandemic. But with good professional cleaning, consumers are very open to reuse ecosystems, frankly, just like we're comfortable at a dentist having them use reusable tools in our mouth uh, and don't question that because we trust hygienic cleaning practices are taking place. What has suffered, by the way, during the pandemic is consumer driven reuse, you know, taking your cup back to a Starbucks to have it refilled or shopping with a reusable shopping bag or a dispensing station at a retailer. Now, we do believe this is the biggest learning we've had is that what consumers need in sustainability is first and foremost convenience, then features and benefits, and then to achieve that convenience and those features and benefits at the right value. The way we're trying to achieve convenience in a reuse model is really focusing on this concept of buy anywhere and return anywhere which is why we're really proud to, in addition to the FMCG, the fast moving consumer goods category, we've partnered with QSR, quick serve restaurants like Burger King, Tim Hortons, even McDonald's, uh, who are soon going to be offering reusable packaging with the benefit that you can purchase your hopefully impossible Whopper and soda at a Burger King and drop it off at a Kroger and vice versa. So hopefully this gives you a little taste in how we're trying to eliminate the idea of waste and very much look forward to answering your questions. 
Thanks, Tom. That was great. I have uh, questions for you from the audience. Uh, how can these approaches be replicated in areas where the majority of waste is produced, uh, like emerging markets, specifically East Asia and the Pacific? Is it more difficult to bring these systems there? It's, it's a very good question. And I would want to clarify that waste is produced absolutely everywhere. Um, the difference is the systems, the waste management systems that are in place are perhaps more developed in wealthier countries because recycling is frankly a major luxury. Now, we did open as the TerraCycle Foundation operations in Thailand uh, doing major river cleanups. But I will say that the key to all these models Unique recycling, unique recycled content and reuse is access to capital. And what we need is investment in these regions to allow these forms of models to thrive. Because today, direct answer to your question, it is easier launching these types of models in wealthier, larger markets than it is in emerging uh, countries. And so this is something that we really look forward to working on. Uh, but we do need the infusion of funding. So I, I want to ask you about something else that uh, it, to know if TerraCycle is working on it. Have you figured out ways to manufacture products more easily from uh, recycled materials? Is that something you're developing? Absolutely. So, you know, in, in our first two divisions, in uh, TerraCycle's Recycling and Recycled Content Division, we really accept packages for what they are, the joke being they're going to be the same tomorrow as they are today. So our job is there to figure out how to collect and recycle them in the form they're in, and then how to get the companies to integrate these unique forms of post-consumer recycled content without changing uh, the pack form. So the innovation tends to be on our end, but it does it is possible to do just about anything there. The real excitement to me is the development of package design within new models of consumption like reuse, because there you can change the, the entire thought process around the package. Uh, 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 and especially when we change the concept of a package being a cost of goods sold to an asset, there's a phenomenal amount of innovation that can occur and things can be brought out that weren't possible before in a low cost, single use environment. How is a uh, reuse and recyclability progressing in the construction industry? Are you seeing anything happening there? So, you know, we to be very fair to your question, we don't do a lot in the construction industry. Uh, you know, we do do recycling, for example, of safety equipment, of uh, uh, certain disposable products. Um, so it's not my area of expertise, but we have been seeing this concept of, I mean, I think the simple answer in design for circularity is simple design and modular design. Those are two very, very important tenants that can folk, you know, go from construction to consumer product goods. It, what's one of the hardest things to recycle in your vast catalog of things that you guys reuse right now? So every waste stream is like a different animal, right? And we have to figure out typically three things to, to be able to recycle something. First, how is it collected? That could be a health and safety question like diaper recycling uh, with Pampers or blade and razor recycling with uh, companies like Bic or Gillette. Um, uh, 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 how is it done economically? Then how is the processing occur? How do you rip apart those materials and get them into new states? And then actually the most important part is neither of those things is how do we make sure someone is willing to fund that process. Because again, what makes something non-recyclable is typically that it's not profitable uh, to, to recycle. And so for us, where we see challenges are where there isn't a stakeholder who overall feels ownership over that waste stream. You know, if it's a package product, the brand whose logo is on it's going to feel a lot of ownership or the retailer who sold it. But the more generic that object is, the more it's shared across more industries, it's, uh, it's no one owns it. And it's sort of like our commons, right, where no one owns it, they get highly polluted and, and people don't invest into solving it. So um, uh, uh, that's what we always try to attribute is how do we get someone to uniquely care about that particular type of waste uh, 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 as they do something that their logo may be on. Can you walk us through how the process for recycling goes for face masks, which we've all become so much uh, more intimate with? Is it breaking down the material into uh, new fibers that you're making new masks with? Absolutely. So TerraCycle has been recycling PPE for over a decade now. Uh, you're noting PPE is very common in uh, uh, food facilities, food manufacturing facilities, uh, uh, pharmaceutical facilities, and so on. And of course, the pandemic has brought those into general consumer use. So today we uh, collect in a variety of different ways. Uh, and net-net, and the face masks and gloves come into one of our facilities. Where we first separate out gloves and face masks, they do get processed separately. Gloves themselves get separated from latex and nitrile because they're different types of uh, material. The gloves, from there uh, are sent through a very cold temperature process, uh, 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 which makes them brittle. So we can then turn them into a powder. Uh, and then from there can be integrated into products like mats and flooring surface and things of that nature, where that characteristic of rubber, vulcanized rubber is really helpful. In masks, they get shredded. 
we separate the elastomers uh, from the uh, non-woven plastics that make up the front of the mask. These are disposable uh, masks, that is. And then take out the, on the nose, there's usually a metal guard. Once you get each of those separated, they can all be recycled into their no new components. And then that's basically how face mask recycling works.